Chapter 9 A Puzzle Solved The best-selling book in recent times has been the Winston Niles Rumford Authorized Revised Bible. Next in popularity is that delightful forgery, the Beatrice Rumford Galactic Cookbook. The third most popular is the Winston Niles Rumford Pocket History of Mars. The fourth most popular is a children's book, Unk and Bows in the Caves of Mercury by Sarah Horn Canby. The publisher's bland analysis of Mrs. Canby's book success appears on the dust jacket. What child wouldn't like to be shipwrecked on a spaceship with a cargo of hamburgers, hot dogs, ketchup, sporting goods, and soda pop? Dr. Frank Minot, in his Our Adults Harmoniums, sees something more sinister in the love children have for the book. Dare we consider, he asks, how close Unk and Bose are to the everyday experience of children when Unk and Bose deal solemnly and respectfully with creatures that are, in fact, obscenely unmotivated, insensitive, and dull. Minot, in drawing a parallel between human parents and harmoniums, refers to the dealings of Unk and Bose with harmoniums. The harmoniums spelled out for Unk and Bose a new message of hope or veiled derision every fourteen earthling days, for three years. The messages were written, of course, by Winston Niles Rumford, who materialized briefly on Mercury at fourteen-day intervals. He peeled off harmoniums here, slapped others up there, making the block letters. In Mrs. Canby's tale, the first intimation given that Rumford is around the caves from time to time is given in a scene very close to the end, a scene wherein Unk finds the tracks of a big dog in the dust. At this point in the story it is mandatory, if an adult is reading the story aloud to a child, for the adult to ask the child with delicious hoarseness, Who was a dog? Dog was a Kazakh. Dog was a Winston Niles Rumford's drait big mean chronosynclastic infundibulated dog. Unk and Bose had been on Mercury for three earthling years when Unk found Kazakh's footprints in the dust on the floor of a cave corridor. Mercury had carried Unk and Bose twelve and a half times around the sun. Unk found the prints on a floor six miles above the chamber in which the dented, scarred, and rock-bound spaceship lay. Unk didn't live in the spaceship anymore, and neither did Bose. The spaceship served merely as a common supply base to which Unk and Bose returned for provisions once every earthling month or so. Unk and Bose rarely met. They moved in very different circles. The circles in which Bose moved were small. His abode was fixed and richly furnished. It was on the same level as the spaceship, only a quarter of a mile away from it. The circles in which Unk moved were vast and restless. He had no home. He traveled light and he traveled far, climbing ever higher until he was stopped by cold. Where the cold stopped Unk, the cold stopped the harmoniums, too. On the upper levels where Unk wandered, the harmoniums were stunted and few. On the cozy lower level where Bunk lived, the harmoniums were plentiful and fast-growing. Bose and Unk had separated after one earthling year together in the spaceship. In that first year together, it had become clear to both of them that they weren't going to get out unless something or somebody came and got them out. That had been clear, even though the creatures on the walls continued to spell out new messages emphasizing the fairness of the test to which Unk and Bose were being subjected, the ease with which they might escape if only they would think a little harder, if they would only think a little more intricately. Think, the creatures would say. Unk and Bose separated after Unk went temporarily insane. Unk had tried to murder Bose. Bose had come into the spaceship with a harmonium, which was exactly like all the other harmoniums, and he'd said, Ain't he a cute little feller, Unk? Unk had gone for Bose's throat. Unk was naked when he found the dog tracks. The lichen green uniform and black fiber boots of the Martian assault infantry had been scoured to threads and dust by the touch of stone. The dog tracks did not excite Unk. 
Unk's soul wasn't filled with the music of sociability or the light of hope when he saw a warm-blooded creature's tracks, saw the tracks of man's best friend. And he still had very little to say to himself when the tracks of a well-shod man joined those of the dog. Unk was at war with the environment. He had come to regard his environment as being either malevolent or cruelly mismanaged. His response was to fight it with the only weapons at hand, passive resistance and open displays of contempt. The footprints seemed to Unk to be the opening moves in one more fat-headed game his environment wanted to play. He would follow the tracks, but lazily, without excitement. He would follow them simply because he had nothing else scheduled for the time. He would follow them. He would see where they went. His progress was knobby and ramshackle. Poor Unk had lost a lot of weight, and a lot of hair, too. He was aging fast. His eyes felt hot and his skeleton felt rickety. Unk never shaved on Mercury. When his hair and beard got so long as to be a bother, he would hack away wads of thatch with a butcher knife. Bose shaved every day. Bose gave himself a haircut twice an earthling week with a barber kit from the spaceship. Bose, twelve years younger than Unk, had never felt better in his life. He had gained weight in the caves of Mercury, and serenity, too. Bose's home vault was furnished with a cot, a table, two chairs, a punching bag, a mirror, dumbbells, a tape recorder, and a library of recorded music on tape consisting of 1,100 compositions. Bose's home vault had a door on it, a round boulder with which he could plug the vault's mouth. The door was necessary, since Bose was God Almighty to the harmoniums. They could locate him by his heartbeat. Had he slept with his door open, he would have awakened to find himself pinned down by hundreds of thousands of his admirers. They would have let him up only when his heart stopped beating. Bose, like Unk, was naked, but he still had shoes. His genuine leather shoes had held up gorgeously. True, Unk had walked fifty miles to every mile walked by Bose, but Bose's shoes had not merely held up. They looked good as new. Bose wiped, waxed, and shined them regularly. He was shining them now. The door of his vault was blocked by the boulder. Only four favored harmoniums were inside with him. Two were wrapped about his upper arms. One was stuck to his thigh. The fourth, an immature harmonium only three inches long, clung to the inside of his left wrist, feeding on Bose's pulse. When Bose found a harmonium he loved more than all the rest, that was what he did, let the creature feed on his pulse. You like that? he said in his thoughts to the lucky harmonium. Ain't that nice? He had never felt better physically, had never felt better mentally, had never felt better spiritually. He was glad he and Unk had separated, because Unk liked to twist things around to where it seemed that anybody who was happy was dumb or crazy. What makes a man be like that? Bose asked the little harmonium in his thoughts. What's he think he's gaining compared to what he's throwing away? No wonder he looks sick. Bose shook his head. I keep trying to interest him in you fellers, and he just got madder. Never helps to get mad. I don't know what's going on, said Bose in his thoughts, and I'm probably not smart enough to understand if somebody was to explain it to me. All I know is we're being tested somehow by somebody or something a whole lot smarter than us, and all I can do is be friendly and keep calm and try to have a nice time till it's over. Bose nodded. That's my philosophy, friends, he said to the harmoniums stuck to him. And if I'm not mistaken, that's yours too. I reckon that's how come we hit it off so good. The genuine leather toe of the shoe that Bose was shining glowed like a ruby. Men, ah, now, men, 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 Bose said to himself, staring into the ruby. When he shined his shoes, he imagined that he could see many things in the rubies of the toes. Right now, Bose was looking into a ruby and seeing Unk strangling poor old Stony Stevenson at the stone stake on the iron parade ground back on Mars. The horrible image wasn't a random recollection. It was dead center in Bose's relationship with Unk. 
Don't truth me, said Bose in his thoughts, and I won't truth you. It was a plea he had made several times to Unc. Bose had invented the plea, and its meaning was this. Unc was to stop telling Bose truths about the harmoniums, because Bose loved the harmoniums, and because Bose was nice enough not to bring up truths that would make Unc unhappy. Unc didn't know that he had strangled his friend Stony Stevenson. Unc thought Stony was still marvelously alive, somewhere in the universe. Unc was living on dreams of a reunion with Stony. Bose was nice enough to withhold the truth from Unc, no matter how great the provocation had been to club Unc between the eyes with it. The horrible image in the ruby dissolved. Yes, Lord, said Bose in his thoughts. The adult harmonium on Bose's upper left arm stirred. You asked an old Bose for a concert? Bose asked the creature in his thoughts. That's what you're trying to say? you trying to say, Old oh, Bose, I don't want to sound ungrateful on account of I know it's a great honor to get to be right here, close to your heart. Only I keep thinking about all my friends outside, and I keep wishing they could have something good, too. That what you're trying to say? said Bose in his thoughts. You're trying to say, please, Papa Bose, put on a concert for all the poor friends outside. That's what you're trying to say? Bose smiled. You don't have to flatter me, he said to the harmonium. The small harmonium on his wrist doubled up, extended itself again. What you trying to tell me, he asked it. You trying to say, Uncle Bose, your pulse is just too rich for a little tad like me. Uncle Bose, please just play some nice, sweet, easy music to eat. That's what you trying to say? Bose turned his attention to the harmonium on his right arm. The creature had not moved. Ain't you the quiet one, though? Bose asked the creature in his thoughts. Don't say much, but thinking all the time. I guess you're thinking old Bose is pretty mean not just letting the music play all the time, huh? The harmonium on his left arm stirred again. What's that you say? said Bose in his thoughts. He cocked his head, pretended to listen, though no sounds could travel through the vacuum in which he lived. You say, please, King Bose, play us the 1812 overture? Bose looked shocked, then stern. Just because something feels better than anything else, he said in his thoughts, that don't mean it's good for you. Scholars, whose field is the Martian War, often exclaim over the queer unevenness of Rumford's war preparations. In some areas, his plans were horribly flimsy. The shoes he issued his ordinary troops, for instance, were almost a satire on the temporariness of the jerry-built society of Mars, on a society whose whole purpose was to destroy itself in uniting the peoples of Earth. In the music libraries Rumford personally selected for the company motherships, however, one sees a great cultural nest egg, a nest egg prepared as though for a monumental civilization that was going to endure for a thousand earthling years. It is said that Rumford spent more time on the useless music libraries than he did on artillery and field sanitation combined. As an anonymous wit has it, the army of Mars arrived with 300 hours of continuous music and didn't last long enough to hear the minute waltz to the end. The explanation of the bizarre emphasis on the music carried by the Martian motherships is simple. Rumford was crazy about good music, a craze, incidentally, that struck him only after he had been spread through time and space by the chronosynclastic infundibulum. The harmoniums in the caves of Mercury were crazy about good music, too. They had been feeding on one sustained note in the song of Mercury for centuries. When Bose gave them their first taste of music, which happened to be La Sacre du Printemps, some of the creatures actually died in ecstasy. A dead harmonium is shriveled and orange in the yellow light of the mercurial caves. A dead harmonium looks like a dried apricot. On that first occasion, which hadn't been planned as a concert for the harmoniums, the tape recorder had been on the floor of the spaceship. The creatures who had actually died in ecstasy had been in direct contact with the metal hull of the ship. Now, 
two and a half years later, Bose demonstrated the proper way to stage a concert for the creatures so as not to kill them. Bose left his home vault, carrying the tape recorder and the musical selections for the concert with him. In the corridor outside were two aluminum ironing boards. These had fiber pads on their feet. The ironing boards were six feet apart, and spanning them was a stretcher made of aluminum poles and lichen fiber canvas. Bose placed the tape recorder in the middle of the stretcher. The purpose of the engine resulting was to dilute and dilute and dilute the vibrations from the tape recorder. The vibrations before they reached the stone floor had to struggle through the dead canvas of the stretcher, down the stretcher handles, through the ironing boards, and finally through the fiber pads on the feet of the ironing boards. The dilution was a safety measure. It guaranteed that no harmonium would get a lethal overdose of music. Bose now put the tape in the recorder and turned the recorder on. Throughout the concert he would stand guard by the apparatus, his duty was to see that no creature crept too close to the apparatus. His duty when a creature crept too close was to peel the creature from the wall or floor, scold it, and paste it up again a hundred yards or more away. If you ain't got no more sense than that, he would say in his thoughts to the foolhardy harmonium, you're going to wind up out here in left field ever time. Think it over. Actually, a creature placed a hundred yards from the tape recorder still got plenty of music to eat. The walls of the caves were so extraordinarily conductive, in fact, that harmoniums on cave walls miles away got whiffs of Bose's concerts through the stone. Unk, who had been following the tracks deeper and deeper into the caves, could tell from the way the harmoniums were behaving that Bose was staging a concert. He had reached a warm level where the harmoniums were thick. Their regular pattern of alternating yellow and aquamarine diamonds was breaking up, was degenerating into jagged clumps, pinwheels, and lightning bolts. The music was making them do it. Unk laid his pack down, then laid himself down to rest. Unk dreamed about colors other than yellow and aquamarine. Then he dreamed that his good friend Stony Stevenson was waiting for him around the next bend, his mind became lively with the things he and Stoney would say when they met. Unk's mind still had no face to go with the name of Stoney Stevenson, but that didn't matter much. What a pair, Unk said to himself. By that he meant that he and Stoney, working together, would be invincible. I tell you, Unk said to himself with satisfaction, that is one pair they want to keep apart at all costs. If old Stony and old Unk ever get together again, they better watch out. When old Stony and old Unk get together, anything can happen, and it usually does. Old Unk chuckled. The people who were supposedly afraid of Unk's and Stony's getting together were the people in the big, beautiful buildings up above. Unk's imagination had done a lot in the three years with the glimpses he'd had of the supposed buildings, of what were in fact solid, dead, dumb cold crystals. Unk's imagination was now certain that the masters of all creation lived in those buildings. They were Unk's and Bose's, and maybe Stoney's jailers. They were experimenting with Unk and Bose in the caves. They wrote messages in harmoniums. The harmoniums didn't have anything to do with the messages. Unk knew all those things for sure. Unk knew a lot of other things for sure. He even knew how the buildings up above were furnished. The furniture didn't have any legs on it, it just floated in air, suspended by magnetism. And the people never worked at all, and they never worried about a thing. Unk hated them. He hated the harmoniums, too. He peeled a harmonium from the wall and tore it in two. It shriveled at once, turned orange. Unk flipped the two-piece corpse at the ceiling. And, looking up at the ceiling, he saw a new message written there. The message was disintegrating because of the music, but it was still legible. The message told Unk in five words how to escape surely, easily, and swiftly from the caves. He was bound to admit, when given the solution to the puzzle that he had failed to solve in three years, that the puzzle was simple and fair. 
Unk scuttled down through the caves until he came upon Bose's concert for the harmoniums. Unk was wild and bug-eyed with big news. He could not speak in a vacuum, so he hauled Bose to the spaceship. There, in the inert atmosphere of the cabin, Unk told Bose of the message that meant escape from the caves. It was now Bose's turn to react numbly. Bose had thrilled to the slightest illusion of intelligence on the part of the harmoniums, but now, having heard the news that he was about to be freed from his prison, Bose was strangely reserved. That... that explains that other message, said Bose softly. What other message? asked Unk. Bose held up his hands to represent a message that had appeared on the wall outside his home four earthling days before. It said, Bose, don't go, said Bose. He looked down self-consciously. We love you, Bose. That's what it said. Bose dropped his hands to his side, turned away as though turning away from unbearable beauty. I saw that he said, and I had to smile. I looked at them, sweet, gentle fellows on the wall there, and I says to myself, Boys, how's old Bose ever going to go anywhere? Old Bose, he going to be stuck here for quite some time yet. It's a trap, said Unk. It's a what? said Bose. A trap, said Unk. A trick to keep us here. The comic book called Tweety and Sylvester was open on the table before Bose. Bose didn't answer Unk right away. He leafed through the ragged book instead. I expect, he said at last. Unk thought about the crazy appeal in the name of love. He did something he hadn't done for a long time. He laughed. He thought it was a hysterical ending for the nightmare that the brainless membranes on the walls should speak of love. Bose suddenly grabbed Unk, rattled poor Unk's dry bones. I'd appreciate it, Unk, said Bose tautly, if you'd just let me think whatever I'm going to think about that message about how they love me. I mean, he said, you know, he said, it don't necessarily have to make sense to you. I mean, he said, you know... He said, there ain't really any call for you to say anything about it, one way or the other. I mean, he said, you know, he said, these animals ain't necessarily your dish. You don't necessarily have to like them or understand them or say anything about them. I mean, said Bose, you know, said Bose, the message wasn't addressed to you. It's me they said they loved. That lets you out. He let Unk go, turned attention to the comic book again. His broad, brown, slab-muscled back amazed Unk. Living apart from Bose, Unk had flattered himself into thinking he was a physical match for Bose. He saw now what a pathetic delusion this had been. The muscles in Bose's back slid over one another in slow patterns that were counterpoint to the quick movements of his page-turning fingers. You know so much about traps and things, said Bose. How you know there ain't some worse trap waiting for us if we go flying out of here? Before Unk could answer him, Bose remembered that he had left the tape recorder playing and unguarded. Ain't nobody watching out for him at all, he cried. He left Unk, ran to rescue the harmoniums. While Bose was gone, Unk made plans for turning the spaceship upside down. That was the solution to the puzzle of how to get out. That was what the harmoniums on the ceiling had said. Unk, turn ship upside down. The theory of turning the spaceship over was sound, of course. The ship's sensing equipment was on its bottom. When turned over, the ship would be able to apply the same easy grace and intelligence to getting out of the caves that it had used in getting into them. Thanks to a power winch and the feeble tug of gravity in the caves of Mercury, Unk had the ship turned over by the time Bose got back. All that remained to be done for the trip out was to press the on button. The upside-down ship would then blunder against the cave floor, give up, retreat from the floor under the impression that the floor was a ceiling. 
it would go up the system of chimneys under the impression that it was going down, and it would inevitably find the way out under the impression that it was seeking the deepest possible hole. The hole it would eventually find itself in would be the bottomless, sideless pit of space eternal. Bose came into the upside-down ship, his arms loaded with dead harmoniums. He was carrying four quarts or more of the seeming dried apricots. Inevitably, he dropped some, and in stooping to pick them up reverently, he dropped more. Tears were streaming down his face. "'You see!' said Bose. He was raging heartbrokenly against himself. "'You see, Unc!' he said. "'See what happens when somebody just runs off and forgets!' Bose shook his head. "'This ain't all of them," he said. "'This ain't near all of them. He found an empty carton that had once contained candy bars. He put the harmonium corpses into that. He straightened up, his hands on his hips. Just as Unc had been amazed by Bose's physical condition, so was Unc now amazed by Bose's dignity. Bose, when he straightened up, was a wise, decent, weeping brown Hercules. Unc, by comparison, felt scrawny, rootless, and sore-headed. "'You want to do the dividing, Unc?' said Bose. "'Dividing?' said Unc. "'Goofballs, food, soda pop, candy,' said Bose. "'Divide it all?' said Unc. "'My God, there's enough of everything for five hundred years!' There had never been any talk of dividing things before. There had been no shortage and no threat of a shortage of anything. "'Half for you to take with you, and half to leave here with me.' said Bose. Leave with you, said Unc incredulously. You're, you're coming with me, aren't you? Bose held up his big right hand, and it was a tender gesture for silence, a gesture made by a thoroughly great human being. Don't truth me, Unc, said Bose, and I won't truth you. He brushed away his tears with a fist. Unc had never been able to brush aside the plea about truthing. It frightened him. Some part of his mind warned him that Bose was not bluffing, that Bose really knew a truth about Unc that could tear him to pieces. Unc opened his mouth and closed it again. "'You come and tell me the big news,' said Bose. "'Bose, you say, we're gonna be free. And I get all excited and I drop everything I'm doing and I get set to be free.' And I keep saying it over to myself about how I'm going to be free, said Bose. And then I try to think what that's going to be like, and all I can see is people. They push me this way, they push me that, and nothing pleases them, and they get madder and madder on account of nothing makes them happy. And they holler at me on account of I ain't made them happy, and we all push and pull some more. And then, all of a sudden, says Bose, I remember all the crazy little animals I've been making so happy, so easy with music. And I go and find thousands of them lying around dead on account of Bose forgot all about them. He was so excited about being free. And every one of them lost lives I could have saved if I'd have just kept my mind on what I was doing. And then I say to myself, said Bose, I ain't never been nothing good to people, and people never been nothing good to me. So what I want to be free in crowds of people for? And then I knew what I was going to say to you, Unc, when I got back here, said Bose. Bose now said it. I found me a place where I can do good without doing any harm. And I can see I'm doing good, and them I'm doing good for know I'm doing it. And they love me, Unc, as best they can. I found me a home. And when I die down here someday, said Bose, I'm going to be able to say to myself, Bose, you made millions of lives worth living. Ain't nobody ever spread more joy. You ain't got an enemy in the universe. Bose became for himself the affectionate mama and papa he'd never had. You go to sleep now, he said to himself, imagining himself on a stone deathbed in the caves. 
You're a good boy, Bose, he said. Good night. <laughs>